If you've never heard of diffraction spikes, don't worry. You're either going to love them or hate them by the end of this video. I'm going to start out by showing you this picture. It's the first Hubble deep field image. They've done this a few times since 1995, but this is the very first one. This picture is the product of 342 separate long exposures that were done over a 10 day period. Again, this is in the end of 1995. They pointed the Hubble Space Telescope towards a seemingly empty, tiny little spot in the sky just above the Big Dipper. That means it was pointed away from the very busy heart of the Milky Way galaxy. The idea being to point it towards a spot in the sky that looked pretty empty visually. Needless to say, this picture blew everybody away because almost everything you see in this picture is a galaxy. In fact, they counted roughly 3,000 galaxies in this tiny little spot in the sky. Now the area that they looked is so small that it represents only 1 24 millionth of the total area of that sphere that, that we can see all around the Earth that represents basically the sky. So 3,000 galaxies times 24 million is uh, a whole lot of galaxies. But there are a few stars in this picture, and how do we know that? Well, because of diffraction spikes. You can see them here, 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 uh, and here. There, there might be a few more, but that's most of them. Uh, everything else that you see in this picture, though, is a galaxy. Diffraction spikes are very common in astronomy photos. In fact, they're so common that we expect to see them. If you ask anybody, including little kids to draw a star, they're gonna show it with spikes coming out of it. Here's what you need to know. Obviously, the spikes are not real. Our own sun does not have spikes. They are strictly an observational anomaly. So why do they keep showing up in pictures taken with a telescope? The answer is that they don't always show up because it depends on the type of telescope that you're using. Here, let me show you. No, seriously, come along. This is the front end of my 8-inch Dobsonian telescope. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope's secondary mirror is supported by four arms, uh, just like my secondary mirror is supported by four thin support arms. And light coming down the tube, it hits these thin straight arms and since light tends to act like a wave, it will coalesce on the other side of this thin obstacle or a set of thin obstacles like a diffraction grating. But let's focus on our straight thin support arms right here. And each arm generates a diffraction spike. All right, so there's a lot of confusion about how the diffraction spikes are laid out relative to the support arm. So let's talk about the most simple type of telescope. We're just gonna have a simple refractor. It's got a big lens and there is a star in the middle of it. This is the configuration that's pointed at a star. What will you see? Well, you're just gonna see a dot. Uh, simple enough, right? There's no obstructions, there's no support arms, there's nothing. So this is the layout, a big lens, and you're gonna see a dot in the middle when you look through the telescope. But let's make it a little bit more complicated. Let's add a secondary mirror. Let's move over to something like a schmidt cassegrain or a Maxitov cassegrain We've got a secondary mirror just floating in the middle. What are you going to see? Well, you're still going to see a dot. Now, you might see a little bit of fuzz around it, just depending on the quality of your telescope. But generally speaking, you should just see a dot. Now, let's go to a fully supported secondary mirror, one that has one support arm. What do you see? Let's have that support arm coming down here. So the way this works is that visibly diffraction spikes come out perpendicular from the support arm. So you have a vertical here, so the diffraction spike is gonna be a very light diffraction spike coming out like that, both sides. And that's because even though it's only got a support arm on one side, the way that it works optically is it is symmetric. Now let's say we put another support arm up here. Well, we're still gonna have diffraction spikes coming out like that. So they're gonna double up and we're gonna get a stronger diffraction spike like that. Now let's go ahead and add a third support arm. But in this case, the diffraction spikes will be vertical. So we're gonna have a light set of diffraction spikes that way. Now let's go full uh, Hubble or full Dobsonian. We've got the four supports and that just makes the diffraction spikes all a little more intense. So this is what you get when you have a Newtonian that has the four support arms that are at 90 degrees to each other. And the James Webb telescope has six diffraction spikes. Technically, it has eight. Uh, let's talk about that. So the James Webb Telescope is a little bit different. It has 18 separate mirrors that are all put together in a configuration that this is actually just uh, showing four of them. They actually go around a hollow section in the middle. 
So these are all joined at these hexagonal angles. As it turns out, these angles are the driving force on the diffraction spikes for the James Webb. So what might you get? Well, you'll get a vertical spike. You'll get um, a spike like that. And this is my best artist rendition, something like that. But if you look close, you'll see the James Webb actually has another little spike right there, right? Just a little, little one. That comes from the fact that the secondary mirror on the James Webb telescope actually has three arms, right? So it's, it's actually closer to something like this. Now, these bottom two lines are lined up with the hexagonal angle. All those do is compound a couple of these diffraction spikes, but there's this one arm that's vertical, and we know that the diffraction spikes go perpendicular to the support arm, so it gets a tiny little diffraction spike like that. So that explains why you get these unique uh, patterns of diffraction spikes. If you add more support arms, you put funny angles in them, well, you're just gonna get more interesting diffraction spikes. Here are two images of the same object in deep space. This is called the Pillars of Creation, found in the Eagle Nebula. On the left is an image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Note that the brightest stars have four diffraction spikes at right angles to each other. Now, on the right is the same image taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, note that the brightest stars have six large spikes, and if you look close, there are two small spikes that are caused by that vertical support of the secondary mirror. So the next time you see a Hubble or James Webb image, look for those spiky stars. So believe it or not, this is the only refractor that I have in the workshop. This is a G Skyer. It's a general purpose, a relatively cheap and affordable one. But you know, it's very different from any of the reflectors in that it just has a big glass lens at the front. There's no secondary mirror. There's no support struts. There's nothing that would cause diffraction spikes. But let's see if we can fix that. I've gone ahead and I've made some fake support struts out of pizza box cardboard. So this will be the vertical strut. And this one will be the horizontal. And we'll take this outside to see if we can create some artificial diffraction spikes with a refractor telescope. Arcturus is the brightest star that we can see tonight. So that's the one we're going to use. The G-Sky Telescope has some pretty nice features, but I would rate the primary lens as just, well, acceptable. On the left is what the star looks like with no obstructions, and on the right is what you get when you add the cardboard support struts. Pretty neat stuff. There you go, I drew a star for you. If you're enjoying this video, please push that like button. It means the world to little channels like this, especially when the workshop has finally hit 100 degrees Celsius. But what if you're one of those strange people that doesn't like diffraction spikes? Is there any practical way to eliminate them? Yes, there are a few ways to do it. As I mentioned before, the spikes are caused by light waves that are passing by thin, straight support struts and coalescing on the other side. So if you use curved support struts, you can dissipate the diffraction of that light in such a way that it doesn't pile up as a concentrated spike. This smoothing out of that driving signal has this funny name. It's called apodization. Now, that's kind of neat, right? But there is actually a much easier way to do this. And that's by masking the support strut with an irregular shape that's kind of like this. Notice that there really aren't any straight or parallel lines. Uh, they're really kind of curved. And it basically breaks up the diffraction patterns before they have a chance to coalesce. Uh, these shapes are called uh, aigrettes. Fortunately, you can download pre-made files for these and print them at home on your 3D printer. I'll put the Thingiverse link down in the description box below. This particular one is sized to fit on an 8-inch Dobsonian telescope, but you can scale it up to your particular needs. All right, so I'm gonna get the ones that I already painted and I'll show you what they look like installed. They have these little pinch points and they just go right on the veins and they stay there they're on there pretty tight. They're not going to be falling off. And be careful not to drop it down the telescope. A couple of notes. Uh, there's a question about where, where they go on this vein. Now, my guess is that you basically want them to start at what would be the area that is obstructed by the secondary mirror. So at the edge of that. Now, keep in mind that the primary mirror is not as wide as this hole, typically. There's usually a, a gap of between a half an inch or one inch around there. So center these between the edge of the secondary mirror's shadow and the edge of your primary mirror. Now, we're going to take this outside and test it, and we'll put these in one at a time to see what happens to the 
diffraction spikes. Okay, here we go. This is what the star looks like with four bare supports. That means I don't have any of those bat wing masks on them. Uh, let's go ahead and add one of the bat wing masks. Okay, so that didn't do too much, uh, but it did diminish the horizontal spike just slightly, maybe? Let's add another bat wing on the opposite side. This should mask one entire spike. All right, now let's go ahead and add a third mask. Uh, okay, so it diminished the intensity a little bit. And after we add the fourth mask, uh, the spikes simply vanish. Uh, let's go ahead and bring back the original unmasked image. That's pretty darn cool. It's almost like magic. Astrophotographers take advantage of these diffraction spikes all the time to ensure that they have sharp focus. In fact, diffraction spikes are the whole reason behind why the Batonov masks work. They use these on the front of their telescopes. This is what you typically see when adjusting your focus knob when you have a Batonov mask mounted on the front of your telescope. You just keep turning the knob back and forth until that central diffraction spike bisects the X just perfectly. Then you remove the Batonov mask and from that point on you'll have perfect focus. If you're curious, I have an entire video dedicated to the history of these and how they work. Leave a message down below and let me know whether you love or hate the diffraction spikes that you see on the starry images. Thanks for watching everybody and clear skies.